Hello and welcome to the fourth and the last one of my alternate timeline World War II diorama series. In this one, I'm building the second German section of the building. Let's get to it. So, for this mech build, I sorted some key items as usual. I'll use cock caps for leg joints, big plastic caps for the section where turret fits the bottom part of the mech, plastic rings in various sizes, this random plastic cap for a hatch, acetone bottle caps for a fuel tank to go behind the turret. For its steel guns, I'm using these soap bottle pump pieces and a pair of straws. This candy dispenser cap for a second hatch, some figure kit screws for detailing, old broken epoxy ring I used to wear, some dowels, dental sticks, they always result good in mechanical creations, various plastic bits and pieces for extra detail, a lighter part, some old SD cards I don't use anymore, electric cables as usual to add extra detail, card stock, various jewel bits and beads, and of course cardboard material. I start with making the basic boxy shape of the turret. At this point my only reference is some images and illustrations of a P1000 Rata and its somewhat iconic guns on the barrel. So I'm using the pump plastic pieces that I'll use for guns as a reference while making the sloped front section of the turret. Since I really suck at measuring like a pro, I had to cut off extra strips to increase the height of the tower. Once I had the basic shape of the turret sturdy enough, I started on giving it curves. Of course, without measuring much, gluing cardboard and cutting off the excess in a barbaric way. After that, I needed to cover the roof of it. So, I drew the cut lines and cut a section from the sheet. And did the same for the bottom part as well. I have to be brutally honest here. You can't see that on camera, but there are many offsetting curves, ends not meeting, uneven joining sections here and there. All these really put me off during the build. These stuff always look wonky, wobbly and ugly in general. When I start getting disappointed, I always rely on covering the gaps with baking soda glue combination and the Dremel sanding option give me a huge relief. Also, after enough scratch build projects, I now know that once I start painting it, I start loving it with every layer of paint. So, for those who want to start the hobby or struggle the same way I do, you can take my humble advice to just never stop and never trust something you build before you paint it. At this point I started working on the dual guns this beast will have. I made sure to sand the straws roughly. The somewhat smooth surface and round shape of straws make it so hard to paint on them. Next, I glued the straws on the plastic pieces as straight and evenly positioned as possible. During this process, I couldn't get a good bonding with the regular CA glue I use. I glued them together again later off the camera with a thicker kind of CA glue. I added round jewelry beads to give the nozzles a bit of a detail. Here I decided to toy with the idea of using masking tape. Masking tape has a bit of a paper texture on it which I thought would look good once painted. Tested the positioning of the guns on the turrets and once I was satisfied with a good position and good fit I glued them in their slots. Next, I glued a bottle cap underneath the turret for it to be a part of the housing, so it could rotate once finished. And with the acetone caps, I started building the fuel tank to go behind the turret. This is my fifth mech ever since I started, and the fourth one to have this kind of a fuel tank at the back type of detail. Maybe it's safe for me to say this is my signature detail from now on. And occasionally, my work area had been invaded by not-so-feral wildlife. Once I was sure the fuel tank pieces are sanded enough, I glued the caps together, and glued cardboard stripes on each side as I usually do with these. When I first thought of this detailing, I got inspiration from oil darts. 
I also cut a pair of pieces out of cardboard to act as a rack for the fuel tank to sit on. Once the main gunk and excess glue is sanded, I completed some parts with sanding sticks and completed the sanding process. At this point I started working on details. I measured the sides to cut off cardboard to serve as armor plating or extra armor panels for its sides. I glued the candy dispenser bottle cap to serve as a gunner's hatch or something like that. It already had an openable lid so <laughs> why not. I glued a pair of zip tie cutouts to resemble a lever or something holding the hatch. I added a circular cardboard cutout, then a circular plastic piece, and then circular plastic cap to complete the secondary hatch. This one is obviously bigger than the other, and I imagined this to be a hatch where ammunition of guns would be loaded. I used a pen tip, a zip tie cut and lighter part to create a protected antenna section and glued a lotion bottle nozzle piece to act like um, some sort of a viewpoint, something like periscope in submarines. Added an SD card piece, a figure base, micro SD card, a random plastic piece and so on to create random details on the plain top surface of the turret. The top part of the viewpoint looked dull, so I cut off a pen tip to create another round layer of detail. I realized I glued the micro SD card unevenly and it looked bad, so I covered up that mistake by adding the broken epoxy ring house over it to cover up that mistake. Added circular jewelry bits right in the middle of the sides of the fuel tank to make it a bit more appealing to look at. At this point I wanted a climbing option to the top of the turret. I imagined in order to get into this already tall mech, the mech would be in a squat position and, and from there the soldiers would climb onto the turret. So I marked the points to drill enough holes for a 9 step climbing ladders. I bent armature wires for this off the camera, added them to their places and glued them. A fun fact, the reason I like cardboard material and use it almost always is that due to its fibery texture you can glue almost anything on it with ease with CA glue almost instantly. With the leather thing out of the way I started working on something I planned to do even before I started working on this Mac and the thing I kept hesitating to start. I don't know what this would be called in military terms, in some tanks, cannons, at least the ones built and used up until recent past, there is a tarp like cover around the guns. I believe it's there to protect the moving parts of the guns from weather elements like rain, wind, dust, etc. So here I tried to replicate that. First I tried to glue paper towel with CA glue, hoping the CA glue would instantly dry and attach the paper towel to the cardboard. But I failed with it. Still didn't want to remove it, but went back to my original plan to do the same with toilet paper and diluted PVA glue. Either it worked better and would have been a better option to go for, or there was enough paper towel for the toilet paper to glue onto. Either way, I achieved a pretty close result to what I had in my mind. I will work on improving this method in the future builds for sure. While waiting for the PVA glue I mentioned to dry, I started working on the lower body where the turret would sit in. I cut off pieces with a bit of uh, random angles and hoped for a good looking result to be honest. Once I had the lower body done, I started to add details on it. For the front and rear corner parts, I used these metallic jewelry bits. They always resemble armor plating to me. Also turned a couple of pieces into a pair of headlights as I usually do with these necks.
I didn't have enough number of the set bits to cover the sides as well, so instead I decided to cut off cardstock strips and glued them on the sides to create texture. At this point I started working on rivets. I used rhinestones to represent bigger rivets, used smaller beads to represent smaller rivets wherever I saw fit. Turrets ended up being rear heavy, so as you may have realized that I had to take the bottle cap underneath to further back. And I covered around the gun with cardboard strips to create some depth there. Which I'm happy to do so since it made painting that area much more easier during the paint. I glued small beads I had over the stripes on the sides to make them more interesting to look at. After turret and the lower body done, I started working on the legs as the last part of this mag. Unlike the previous 3 mags I built in this series, I utilized cock bottle caps. Due to them having serrated form and would make the legs look bulkier. So I'm using them as the biggest leg joints that would be right below the lower body. From here on, legs were quite straightforward to make. I made a section and dry fit it on a joining piece I made, then next one and the next one. Trick here is to find the right position for each leg piece before gluing them together. Well, easier said than done, I still can't properly align these perfectly. There is always a millimeter or two difference between each other. So I try to compensate that by adding a layer of cardboard piece underneath the feet or right on top where I would glue it on the lower body, depending on how I feel about it at that time. Another thing I find myself struggling with this kind of thing is the weight distribution. This one ended up being top and rear heavy as well, so in order to balance it, I glued the heaviest knots I could fit by this feet section, which usually works out fine. After that I started to cover the gaps on the legs. For this I score cardboard strips so I can bend them while having a bit of a texture. I welcome any extra texture when building mechanical stuff. You wouldn't believe it but making the feet, making them look better etc. takes longer time than building the entire pair of legs. There is always so much room to add extra details. Like right here how I utilized q-tips to represent some sort of a hydraulic part. Although looking at it now I could have added an extra one on each leg. I cut off random sections from the figure sprues and glued them on the upper legs. Glued plastic ring pieces where the joints are. I did this because I don't have that big jewelry bits to cover there and I didn't want to bother with cutting circle shape from cardboard. The blue pieces are the cut off and unused parts from candy dispenser lid I used on the turret. I glued these there in order to cover the back parts of each feet. I covered the ugly gap right underneath the orange piece I glued before. Next I started decorating the joint parts with round jewelry bits cardboard cutouts and bits with interesting shapes. To be honest this ended up looking like the rear end of a jet engine or some sort of a reactor. I'm keeping this idea for a future build as well. Just like before I added various size and shape beads as rivets. I added cardboard cutouts in the empty spaces around the sprues to make the area look bulky. Cut a dowel in half to add extra detail on the front side of the lower legs. I added pipe beads to make the knee joint mechanism look like it's somewhat connected to the assembly just behind it. 
I glued four beads behind the legs so I can stick wires in them, representing cabling or some sort of a hose. Before I started on the paint job, I remembered that I still needed to make an exhaust pipe for this one as well. Since this one is a much bigger mech, I decided to make two instead of one. Just like how I made the previous mech's exhaust units, I cut off a skewer as its main body. Glue the smaller section for it to be the neck part and an angular one where it ends. Once dried, I rounded the corners as much as possible. Cut a cardstock material, rounded it up so it can wrap around the pipe to be used as some sort of a heat shield. I glued it on the pipe. Once dried, I drilled holes on it in a somewhat symmetrical pattern. And drilled holes on the pipes. Let's just look at it one last time before priming. It really looks like a joke. Primed it in black as usual. Then made a grey mixture with Revell Stone Grey and some black. Diluted it down and painted the whole thing with it. Even though I never used an airbrush before, I think it's safe to say that since the stuff I make are getting bigger and bigger, if I had an airbrushing option, it would be both less time consuming to paint and I would consume lesser amount of paint. Once the first coat of grey dried, I applied a more diluted grey with a drop of red in it and applied it all over the um, both parts. After that, I mixed a darker grey paint and dabbed it on all the rivets and some parts sticking out to give them a bit of a depth. I painted some parts with anthracite grey and some parts with German grey in order to differentiate some sections a little bit further. Painted the lights with Vallejo silver the cables with red. Then started working with the bronze color. The joints and its supposedly moving parts, the exhaust shields, etc. At this point I wasn't really all that certain about what color to paint the tarp-like detail around the guns. I was going to paint it with a tan-like color, but since the rest of the mech is covered in tons of grey, I decided to paint them in anthracite grey and think for a while. I touched over some sticking bits with natural steel color over the bronze parts. Painted the dowel cuts with Vallejo light grey. Then since there was some light grey on the tray, I decided to dry brush the tarps around the guns with it. On the second dry brush turn, I added a drop of medium flesh tone paint in the light grey and dry brushed it over them. In order to bring up rivet details further, I applied black wash on all the rivets. As well as over the moving parts and where I could see holes, lines, etc. Another paint job I hesitate to start was to paint the Wehrmacht cross on this one just like the first German mech I made. This time though, either my hand got steadier or I have a much bigger space to paint onto. I ended up with a better looking result. Just like the last one, I painted a random number with Vallejo Red in order to show which unit, battalion or whatever this mech belongs to. Before I was done, starting from bottom to top, I applied the various colors of weathering powder all over it. As well as rust powders on the exhaust pipes. Once 
while at it I applied extra black powder on the turret in order to give it a dirtier look. And seal them with isopropyl alcohol. Let's give it a short look before it's put on the diorama base. For the diorama base I'm using usual materials, the same size of foam core and styrofoam in two different sizes. I glued them on top of each other. Next I started planning out where which wall plaster rocks I made a while ago would be glued, and then glued them on the base. Also, cut off smaller chunks from styrofoam blocks to make the road work diverse by a bit. Before I started on the ground texture, I rolled a foil ball to make the surface a bit uneven. Applied PVA glue around the rocks for pebbles and small stones to fill the gaps, make the whole thing look saturated. Cover the rest of the surface with diluted PVA glue and covered it with baking soda. Added more pebbles hoping some would dry nicely. Once dried I painted it with black craft paint. Then started painting the rocks with various tones of grey from darker to lighter. And the rest of the surface with a very dark brown to lighter tones. Dry brush the surface with lighter tones of brown, the rocks with lighter tones of grey close to white. Applied Grand Flock the usual way with PVA and diluted PVA glue. Once dried I dusted off the excess flock and there was a problem with the base color. Either the water in the diluted PVA glue or something else I don't know what ruined some of the paint. I'm somewhat fixing it up with a bit of a wedding powders. So for the second object of this build I needed a partially destroyed building. I quickly built one out of cardboard without much thought of details like windows, roof details, etc. I needed to be quick and make something simple since this video had been delayed a week already. Speaking of delay, I know I promised this video for much sooner, but life in general had been very hectic and somewhat confusing for the past couple of months. Much had been in my way of working on these videos. Also, even though I'm enjoying the overall process of this 4 part series, it made me feel like being in a rush and sometimes I ended up finishing sloppily. After this video, I'll probably skip making big dioramas or diorama builds in general for a while and instead focus on making standalone scratch build creations. We'll see. Now back to the build. I covered the walls with styrofoam bricks left over from the previous video's hotel structure. I glued some steering sticks to represent exposed floorboards. To be honest, if I wasn't in such a rush, I would make a second floor to this and then show the broken parts, partially destroyed roof, etc. But it is what it is. Once the glued parts dried, I primed it in black. Then mixed a brickish red color and painted it in two coats. Painted the floorboards in various wooden brownish paints. And painted the door. In order to bring up the broken sections, I applied black weathering powder, as well as some black and mud color powders to the bottom part of it, as I usually do to blend the building to the base better. Next order of business was to make some trees for this section as well, using skewers, copy stairs, toothpicks, etc., as well as pre made polyester tree foliage. Not showing this process as I made similar trees for the past three videos. I made two of the trees intentionally the way they are as if they are dead or died.
Starting with the trees, I put every object of this diorama in its pre-designated place. As well as adding foliage and dried grass here and there to close gaps and holes that I don't want to see. Thank you all for being here and watching the final episode in this fictional series. It's been a fun and educating build for me, which took a long while to finish. If you enjoyed this, give this video a like and let me know if you have any fictional ideas that I can plan and work on. I'll see you all in the next video, take care.